Okay, today we're gonna talk about mosquitoes, mosquitoes and diseases. So what do mosquitoes look like? Which of these is a mosquito? <laughs> Number two and five, correct. Um, I just show this because some people who haven't seen them before might, well, everybody's seen mosquitoes before, but some people might confuse sand flies with mosquitoes, they're not. Everybody, when they're young, confuses crane flies with mosquitoes. They're not mosquitoes. Um, quick thing, quick note on like spelling. So, uh, oh, hang on, let me enable editing here so I can draw. There we go. Um, both of these are correct. Mosquitoes, T-O-E-S, and mosquitoes. OS. I think one of these is like the British spelling. When I was first studying mosquitoes, like I would oscillate between these two. They're both correct, right D? Is it, that's correct? Yeah, they're both correct. You just kind of want to pick one and like stick to it. I prefer this one. Yeah, but it's shorter to write. So anyway, anyway, just pick a spelling. Um, Okay, so mosquitoes arose about 100 million years ago. Um, and the point of this slide is that there are many mosquitoes. Okay, there's about 3,500 known species. And the ones that we focus on in the class are the ones that feed on humans, right? Because those are the ones that are spreading diseases. But just know that that's the vast sort of like minority of mosquitoes that feed on humans. Most of the mosquitoes, you don't ever see them, you don't ever overlap with them because they're in the woods or in the jungle and they're feeding on like frogs or like weird stuff like that. So there's many, many mosquitoes that you just, you never, you never see them. Um, and it's a small percentage that feed on humans, but those are the ones we care about. And the reason that they bite you, so last week, or, la or last session, we talked about how the females are the only ones that feed. I think we talked about this, right? Males don't feed. Did I say that? Maybe I didn't. Females feed on blood, okay? And the males are kind of just nice. They kind of just like, if they go to flowers and they just like suck the flower nectar. Um, so we don't, male mosquitoes don't really bother us that much. It's the females that are nasty. It's the females that are spreading disease. And the reason that they bite you is because they need nutrients for their eggs for vitelogenesis. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. So I already showed this. Again, I'm just sort of hammering this into you. Mosquitoes are the worst animal in terms of how many people they kill. There's one interesting genus that does not feed on blood. That's the Toxorhynchides. So this is a really interesting mosquito. These are tree hole mosquitoes. So if you're like in the woods, right, and here's a tree. Trees sometimes have like little like, I don't know, like a little like nub. And when it rains, it fills up with water. And some mosquitoes come and they lay their eggs in that little hole. These are one of these mosquitoes. And these are, these are, like, the, these are like the nice mosquitoes because they're, these are larvae. They're um, the carnivorous larvae and they actually eat mosquito, other mosquito larvae. So these are the only non-blood feeding mosquitoes that we kind of like know about and they get their protein by eating other mosquitoes. So these are like the, the nice mosquitoes, the toxorhynchides. And sometimes you'll see these like in ecology classes or whatever because they're kind of unique and they're kind of people's favorite. Um, okay. So one of the things you need to know about mosquitoes is not all vector competence is the same for all the mosquitoes. So there's different mosquitoes and different mosquitoes are really, really good at spreading different diseases, different pathogens. Um, so you kind of want to know which each mosquito is like famous for. So there are Anopheles mosquitoes. Anopheles mosquitoes active at dawn and dusk and they're famous for spreading malaria, okay? There's Culex mosquitoes. Culex mosquitoes, a lot of them feed on like birds, which is why they're real good at 
West Nile virus, spreading West Nile virus, because the reservoir for West, West Nile virus is in birds. So they'll bite birds and they overlap, like they, they will also feed on humans if you're in their area. So that's one reason why they can spread viruses like this. And then there are 80s virus or 80s mosquitoes. And these are aggressive day biters. The 80s are famous for being kind of like the worst. Aside from like there's one really bad Anopheles or there's a couple really bad Anopheles, but 80s are sort of famous for being the nastiest mosquitoes. They spread horrible viruses like dengue, yellow fever, West Nile virus. So we'll talk a lot about each of these different mosquitoes, how to tell which from which and sort of like where they fall in the evolutionary tree. Let me just make sure I didn't get any, miss anything. So let me just let me just quick before I go into this slide, let me just quick type out a couple ones you want to remember. Um, there's Anopheles gambiae. Okay, this is in Africa. This one is nasty because it's a human feeder, and it's extra bad because this is the one that's famous for spreading plasmodium falciparum, which is the worst malaria parasite. We'll have a whole lecture on malaria, so stay tuned for when that happens. Uh, but know that Anopheles gambiae is, is kind of a, another one you want to remember. There's another Anopheles, Anopheles stephensi, which is also a malaria spreader. I think it's usually spreading vivax, but somebody would have to fact check me on that. Gambiae is the one that's famous for spreading falciparum in Africa. And then there is Culex pipiens. That's sort of common everywhere. This is called the house mosquito. This is one you find like in your house all the time. So this is a famous one that's spreading um, viruses to humans all over the world. It's called the common house mosquito. And then there is two real famous 80s 80s aegypti, which is the tropical one. We'll talk about that one. And then there's 80s albopictus, which in many regions is replacing aegypti, and its range is sort of more expansive. So we'll talk about these ones. But these are the kind of ones like I study mosquitoes. These are the ones I really have easy. I, it's easy for me to remember. Like I remember these these species. Um, and so these are the ones you probably want to know. Obviously, there's other ones I'm not talking about. Obviously, there's other vectors, um, but these are the ones that come up, come up recursively, and these are the ones that kind of do like a lot of damage, which is why we remember them, at least why I remember them. Okay, now into the slide. So there's a question of if there's these three main sort of like types of mosquitoes, how do you tell the difference between them? when you see them in the wild, like what should you look for? How do you, how do you tell the differences? And the differences, many of those relate to their particular behavior. So I should also declare that all mosquitoes are, so mosquitoes, all mosquitoes are holo or hemimetabolous? Come on. Hemimetabolism is when like the little grasshopper comes out of the egg and then it molts into a bigger grasshopper and then molts into a large grasshopper. Holometabolism is when the caterpillar becomes a pupae and changes into a butterfly. That's holometabolism. So which one are mosquitoes? Yes, it's holometabolous. So all mosquitoes are holometabolous metabolus okay so there's an egg stage obviously an egg stage a larval stage a pupil stage and an adult stage okay and in all mosquitoes the larvae and the uh, not the egg the larvae and the pupil stages are aquatic so Mosquitoes require water, mostly fresh water. I think there might be some like, some mosquitoes that can do like brackish water. Um, 
there's probably some, well, I don't know about like in the middle of the ocean, but yeah, like, the, like when in like, probably like Louisiana or something where the Mississippi is mixing with the, the, the Gulf waters. I'm sure there's mosquitoes that can do the brackish water, but for the most part, they're fresh water. Like that's what, that's what you think of their fresh water um, mosquitoes. Is that correct, D? Okay, so I'm getting it right. <laughs> You would hope, I did my PhD on mosquitoes. You would hope I was good at this. <laughs> um, okay, the eggs are different for each one. So keep in mind, here's Anopheles, here's Culex, here's Aedes. Anopheles are considered like the older mosquitoes in like the evolutionary tree. So it's like Anopheles are thought to kind of represent like what the earliest mosquitoes looked like when they first evolved. And they lay individual eggs, okay? So the female, is laying eggs in the water, okay, directly in the water. And each of these individual eggs, she lays on a little tiny individual raft. So Anopheles eggs float on the top of the water and the individuals. Culex eggs, so this is, this is useful for like, if you're ever gonna go out and you're gonna collect mosquitoes, like you can tell based on like where the eggs are, what kind of egg it is and how they're like, interacting with the environment. So if they're floating and they're an individual, they're probably an Anopheles egg. Culex lay what are called egg rafts. So the, these egg rafts are rafts of about like a hundred eggs. So they glue them together and they float, okay? And they lay them in the water and you can find these egg rafts. They're clearly visible by the eye. I could actually probably draw it up. Well, maybe not up there, but probably like, if you're looking at the screen, they're probably like about that size. I don't know, maybe smaller. <laughs> But you can see them with the eye for sure. And there's about 100 eggs in those rafts. And they lay them directly in the water. They float in the water. Okay. Aedes eggs are quite unique. The Aedes mom, when she's a blood-fed, gravid female, what she does is she looks for water and usually she finds a spot right where the water meets the land and she lays her eggs right here at the intersection between the land and the water and her eggs are unique in a sense that she lays them individually so she might she might choose this spot and then she might fly around and lay a couple eggs over here and then she might fly around and lay a couple eggs over here okay and what she's trying to do is 80s eggs are specially evolved. What they want to do is they want them to dry out first. So they lay them on sort of the land. And then they want them to hatch when it rains. So usually what happens is 80s will come in, lay their eggs. And usually what happens is if there's like a dry spell, the water will recede right? And the water will be like down here. And then once it rains, the water level will rise, soaking the eggs, immersing the eggs, and that's a signal for the eggs to hatch. Why would they want to do this? It should be fairly obvious, but like explain why, why this would be selected for. Yeah, but what, like, okay, what's the selective pressure that's killing them? Why would they want to do this? It's a good hypothesis, um, but I don't think that's correct. What was your thought, Lewis? I was gonna look and see the word. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, because like if they emerge and the water is receding, they die. Yes, exactly. Like, do you want to be born onto an island or an earth that's collapsing? It's kind of like the mosquitoes' perspective. Like, if the water is receding, do you want to hatch into that water? It might recede so much that it it's gone. Does that make sense? And this makes sense perfectly for 80s because many of them lay eggs, not like in gigantic lakes and stuff, although they will, but like some of these you find in like little puddles and things like that. 
So they don't want to lay eggs that are going to hatch into like a receding little puddle of water so that all their babies die. They want to wait so that rain hits and then they have enough time to go through the larval and the pupal stages so that their evolution is actually like they're programmed in a special way to do that. So that's really that's a cool thing about 80s eggs. And so if you work with 80s in the lab, you can have them lay eggs right like on the paper because they think the paper is um, you fill a cup with with water and then they lay their eggs right at the water line on the piece of paper and then you just pull the paper out and you dry it and it's got some eggs on it and then whenever you want to hatch it you just dip it in a tub of water and they'll hatch so 80s are like well, awesome to work with and those eggs will stay viable for quite a long time um okay Let's look at the larvae, how the larvae are different. Anopheles larvae, again, Anopheles are like the weird ones because they're like the old ones. And then there's kind of like what we consider like the more evolved, more recent evolved mosquitoes. Anopheles, so they're aquatic insects. They're aquatic larvae and pupae, but they still have to breathe oxygen. So the way that they get their oxygen is they can't sit in the water underneath the water submerged forever right? They sit and Anopheles lays flat on the top of the surface so that it can breathe, okay? And they won't sit there forever. Like if you, if you pass your hand over top, they will swim down underneath. All the larvae will do that. But Anopheles, you can tell because they lie flat on the surface. Culex and 80s have this structure right here, which is a breathing tube. And usually those breathing tubes, if you were to like zoom in on it, looks something like this and it's got like lots of hairs okay and the function of the hairs is to break the surface tension of the water and then they directly breathe through this little like butt breathing tube um, and this is what it looks like so you'll they'll see them float vertically just sitting at the top of the water and again if you pass your hand over they'll they'll like swim down if they see a shadow and they have eyes and stuff. And usually they're feeding by, they're filter feeders. So they'll filter, they have like mouth parts that will just like filter the water, they'll filter, out, filter out and eat the bacteria and stuff, microorganisms in the water. Um, pupae, pupae all kind of look the same. They all kind of look like a little comma with an eyeball. And the pupal stage is like three days and then they eclose pretty fast. So the big feeding stage is the larval stage. They feed, they get big, they get energy for pupation, and then they just kind of become this little comma at which they go through and metamorphosize into these beautiful dipterin insects. <laughs> um, okay, the adults. Let me just make sure I haven't missed anything. Okay, let's... Talk about males versus females. First look at this. So male versus female in mosquitoes is really easy. Males have these beautiful bushy antennae. They look like this. And they have long palps that bend. So they look like horns. So even though you see this picture, if you're to just look at a mosquito and you see things that go like this, as their palps coming out of their head and their antennae are super bushy, you know that they're a male. So usually like when I find the males in my house, I just, I just kind of like let them be. I'm kind of like, oh, I can tell you're a male. You, you deserve the right to live. <laughs> the females I immediately kill. Uh, and you can tell the females quite easily, again, depending on um, the, oh, I shouldn't say depending on the species, but, um, the females don't have the bushy antennae. And I think all of the main ones, let me check that. Here's the females, female, female. Yeah, none of the females have bushy antennae. So if you see bushy antennae, you know it's a male. If you don't see that, you know for a fact it's a female. You can also just tell once you, once you work with mosquitoes enough, you can tell by eye, the shape of the males are long and thin. Um, they look like this, and the shape of the females is they're they're thick. They got like they look like this. So uh, you can just tell you can just tell by eye, literally. Even even if you don't look for the the, the bushiness or the or the palps. Um. Okay, so that's the sexual dimorphism. 
Now, if you want to tell adults, Anopheles from Culex versus 80s females, what you need to look for is a couple different things. So if you see, let me get a new sheet here. If you see like black, actually, I'll just show you the picture. If you see black and white, you know it's 80s something. So these are, this, this coloration pattern, this black and white coloration pattern, it's always 80s. Okay, so if you see this, you know it's at least 80s. Maybe it's some specific species, but you know the genus, you know it's 80s. That's easy. If you're telling, if you're trying to tell Anopheles from Culex, it's harder because they're just kind of like both ugly brown mosquitoes. But you can tell Anopheles adults because they hold themselves differently. So Anopheles will hold themselves at a 45 degree angle when they're resting and when they're feeding. And and Culex mosquitoes will sort of like sit flat. So that's one way to tell. The other way to tell is on the, I believe it's the palps, yeah. So Culex females have short palps like this, and Anopheles females have long palps, okay? So there are easy, very easy, sexually dimorphic, distinguishable things that you can just look at and you can instantly know, okay, is this male, female? Is this Anopheles, Culex, or 80s? Um, they're, very, they're sexually dimorphic. They're, each species is, is, is different and it's easy to tell. It's easy to tell what's what, as long as you know what to look for and as long as you have like a decent microscope. Um, okay, this is an interesting co comment worth talking about is, okay, the males, right? We've talked a lot. The males have the super bushy antennae. Why? Why would they have that? And male or female and females are just kind of like, yes, what speculate further? He says something involving mating. Not touch. What are the antennae for? Ifan, what do antennae do? Yes, they detect the sexual hormone of the females. So now you know why, like what's the, what's the purpose of the female? The purpose of the female is get blood, lay eggs. What's the purpose of the male? Have sex, right? Find the female. And so the per the, you can tell like just, just that's why they have gigantic bushy, and Tenny is because they're using them to sense for the females' hormones. They find them and they mate. That's the whole purpose of the bushy and tenny. Um, okay, back to the slides. Here's a phylogenetic tree of mosquitoes. Here's the Anopheles, Anopheline, okay? So these are the ones that hold themselves at the 45 degree angle. These are the ones that are older. You can see that according to the phylogeny, they're clearly branched like earlier, which is why we consider them that genus to sort of like represent kind of what it's like the more ancestral mosquitoes in theory, although they're extant. So I guess that's a bad evolutionary argument. Then there's a family called Culicinae. Culicinae. The Culicinae family includes both the 80s and the Culex. Here. And so you can see there's obviously other genera and some of these other genera spread diseases, but you kind of just, for this class, just know about the big three. Um, other things about their evolution. They are dipterans, so all these are dipterans. What does that mean? The order diptera, the, yes, flies with two wings. So diptera means two wings. And what, so ancestrally, the first winged insects had four wings. Like if you look at like the odinates, um, and if you look at more ancestral organizations of wings, they are structured as four wings. What happened to the dipterans? You took Nate's class, right? Like, did he talk about this? 
<laughs> this is going on YouTube. Wait, wait this is going on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> no, stop. Yes, see, good. Uh, they became haltiers. So in the dipterans, these have like D. I don't know if you'd say devolved. They've changed. They've changed their structure to become haltiers. And what are haltiers? Yes, they're little like things that look like this, and they like guide the like like when it flies they like help it fly help it's like maneuverability when it flies so the the flight organization of things that have two wings is is different than how things fly when they have four wings okay got that got that got that this is easy again like you guys I just have this here in case there's people who have like literally never seen a bug. Okay. Bugs have head, thorax, abdomen. Mosquitoes obviously follow the same, the same plan. The gist of the mosquito is it's got six legs. It's got two wings. Here's the haltiers right here. And here's its head. Uh, and then they have the piercing sucking mouth parts, which we discussed last time. If you haven't seen that lecture, go watch it on YouTube if you're watching this online. <laughs> but I'll just say it anyway, quick for review, in case you didn't catch it. This is the labrum. The labrum is the sharp hollow needle. Here it is in this figure. The sharp hollow needle through which the blood sucks up. The yellow thing right here with the tiny hole right there is the hypopharynx, this. And that is through which the mosquito spits. So the important point, again, to reiterate, this will be on the test, is that there are two tubes, which is why the dirty needle analogy is a bad analogy for how mosquitoes spread diseases. Because when a mosquito picks up a disease, it has to escape the midgut, get into the salivary glands, and get injected through this tiny tube the hypopharynx, okay? And again, just for review, the maxillary stylets are the ones that are serrated, okay? So they have like jagged edges and these saw at a frequency that allows the labrum to stab in easily and suck blood. And they find a capillary, they're called selenophages and they suck blood through that. Watch the mouth parts lecture if you don't remember. Um, while this happens, the labium is the piece that protects the mouth parts. It retracts such that this can happen. Okay. We went over this. We went over this. We went over this. Remember that the extrinsic incubation period is the time in the mosquito for what to happen. This is in lecture one. So this, is, this is review. This is in lecture one. The extrinsic incubation period is the time it takes for the pathogen to escape the gut and get into essentially the salivary glands and become, become spreadable in the mosquito. That time is called the extrinsic incubation period. Don't confuse that with the intrinsic incubation period. Okay, terminology you'll hear with a lot of flies that lay eggs, you'll hear this a lot. Um, a batch. A batch is like a, the total eggs from a single gonotrophic cycle. So a gonotrophic cycle for a mosquito is they get a blood meal, they lay eggs, that's one cycle. Then they might go out and take a second gonotrophic cycle by taking a second blood meal and laying eggs. And that's when they're dangerous on that second cycle. So a batch is all the eggs from a single gonotropic cycle. A clutch, a clutch is, so when I was talking about, what was the mosquito? When I was talking about 80s, uh, 80s, they might go, a female might be kind of like flying along a path. She might lay a couple eggs here. That's a clutch. It's not a batch. She might come over here. Lay a couple more eggs, which is a clutch. Two. She might come over here. Lay a couple more eggs, which is a clutch. Three. And these all are a batch. 
um, a mass. I never use this. I've never seen this used, but it's supposedly a collection from multiple females. So perhaps there are scenarios where another female comes along, lays some more eggs here, then there would be a quote unquote mass from multiple mothers. Raft, I have used this because if you work with Culex, you'll obviously use that word. Gravid means it's a female who's got a blood meal and she's ready to lock and load and lay the ovipose the eggs. That's what gravid means. Carrying eggs. Okay. Um, before I go into this, let me just quick talk a little bit about the mosquito mating. So female, male, way it looks when they mate is the male will stick his butt in the female's butt and you'll see flies that look like this. And if you see these in nature, you know that nature is taking its course. And uh, usually what happens is a male will mate how many times? One or more? It's going to mate as much as it possibly can. A male is going to try to mate as many times as it can possibly can. Okay. The female, in this case, most insects, uh, most, um, not insects, but most, most mosquito females, they'll only mate one time. And once they mate, they have little organs that look like this, three little cuticular, so that means they're sclerotized, they're hard shells, balls, called the spermatheca, spermatheca. And the male will store the sperm, or I should say the female will store the sperm in the spermatheca. And as soon as she's mated, she's got a lifetime supply of sperm. Okay, so here's a mated female. And then her priority is straight up just get some blood. And once she gets the blood, she'll synthesize eggs. And then as she lays the eggs, as they pass out during oviposition, that she will inseminate them with sperm from her spermatheca. So it's kind of fascinating. Like I've always found this fascinating, the fact that a mosquito will mate and survive for like maybe, maybe a month. And that whole time, sperm and her spermatheca will be like viable, just kind of like sitting there. I've always kind of found that fascinating. You can actually dissect. So when I dissect, I've dissected spermatheca before, you dissect them and you get these lobes and then you smash them and they crack like eggs. You can actually like see like the cracks and then the sperm all spill out and you can see and like they're totally living like they're they're swimming. It's it's just really cool. So if you ever get a chance, take a look. Um, what? Yeah, they swim. For sure. But that's a good question. Why would they swim? Because um, Right, like it makes sense why human sperm swims because it has to swim to the egg. Maybe there's a, that, I, that's a really good question. Maybe during this process of insemination, it might be essential that the sperm swim out like the spermatheca like duct or something like that. Or it might be essential that the spermatheca swim to get into the spermatheca. Um, but you know for a fact that they swim because they look like this. And things don't look like that long and thin unless their function is to swim. So we know that they swim. And like I said, I've seen it. Like you crack the eggs, they pop out and their tails are like, Rrr. so yes. Um, okay, let's talk about ways to control. So let's talk about now vector control. That's the basic biology of mosquitoes, vector control of mosquitoes. The easiest thing, oh wait, let me just say one more thing about mosquito reproduction before I go on, because this is worthwhile. So in insect ecology and in ecology in general, there's K versus R strategies. Do you know what that means? You say weed? No, not, not weed. K versus R. So R, I think it stands for 
reproductive. I think K stands for carrying capacity. But reproductive strategy, the R strategy is what we call spray and prey. These are reproductive strategies. So the strategy of the mosquito is to mass produce as many daughters and sons as possible and spray them everywhere in the environment, assuming that 99% of those offspring will die, but one will mate and replace all the other 99. Okay. So our strategies are let's reproduce a whole bunch. And a female, like I said, a female will produce about maybe like 30 lower bound, 100 or plus upper bound offspring in one, in one, uh, what you'd call, what was it, the batch of the club, in one batch. Okay. So that's a, that's an R strategy. A K strategy is what humans are or tsetse fly, which we will talk about in the future. Tsetse fly is, this is the investment strategy. This is you, it costs you a lot of energy to produce one offspring and you spend your entire life investing in that offspring, hoping it will, hoping it will do well. That's like TC flies. That's the K strategy. So with this known, now you can kind of understand why is it so hard to control mosquitoes? Because reproductive strategies like this are super good at evolving resistance. They're super good at, if there's just, if you don't kill, if you're doing like an eradication strategy and you don't kill every single mosquito, if you leave just one female, that is gonna rebound incredibly fast because of this R reproductive strategy, okay? So you need to know that. Okay, vector control strategies. So the most common thing to do is literally just get rid of all water that's in people's backyards. So I talked about Aedes aegypti. One of the reasons Aedes aegypti and Albo picked this, both the Aedes, one of the reasons they're nasty is they have evolved. They've evolved to literally like survive and thrive in human backyards. So if you go and you look in like trash dumps, they will lay their eggs in the water that goes in the tires and tires like last forever. So anywhere there's like a tire on the planet, there's probably mosquito, it's probably like 80s mosquito eggs in that. And so it's extremely difficult to control for these because imagine you're in a city, right? Imagine you are in a city and you wanna to try to do like a control program. And there's these big apartment buildings and each of these big apartment buildings has little flower pots on their, what do you, balconies? On their balconies, okay. Unless you go to every single one of these apartment buildings and dump out all the water from those flower pots, you're never gonna really effectively control mosquitoes. So this is why it's so incredibly difficult because these mosquitoes have evolved to literally live next to humans in proximity in our backyards, in the things that we create and in where we store our water, in your rain barrels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things that fill with rain. Okay. But nevertheless, it's a good control strategy to try to limit water because that obviously makes it so that they cannot lay successful eggs. So there's a question people ask me all the time. Is it possible, or two questions actually, um, is it possible to eradicate something like Aedes aegypti? Is it possible to eradicate it? The second thing they ask me always is, is that like what we wanna do? Like, what about the bats? Like, what, what about like ecologically? Like, do we wanna do that? Um, so let me address, let me address, try to address both these questions. Is it possible? So this is kind of like hypothesis. Here I'm kind of like talking about like things that I've read. Um, and this is actually in an assigned reading for today, which is actually a really interesting reading where it's a, it's a Latin American paper and they talk about sort of the experience of Latin American countries trying to eradicate Aedes aegypti. And there's some things that they, that they discover. Okay. So one thing is if you're on an Island, okay. So if you're on like an Island in the Caribbean, it's possible to eradicate mosquitoes on an Island. Okay. If you're on like a mainland, like if you're in like South America, Central America, North America, it's essentially like impossible. 
And they talk about things that, so here are the conditions in this paper they talk about, here are the conditions that you need for when this has worked on small islands in the Caribbean, when they have successfully been able to eradicate Aedes aegypti, there's a couple things that have fallen into place. One is there's usually national funding. So there's like a giant governmental program. And I think it actually says in the paper, it, it's about five, it costs about $5 per person um, to eradicate mosquitoes in a particular area. You need, you actually need like political will from like public health, like officials, like you need, and, and politicians, because if the politicians are not willing to like fund the project, if they cut off funding like halfway through, it, it never, never works out. Most of the times in all the cases where it has worked, they've used DDT. So this is, uh, we'll talk about this insecticide later in the class, but this was a very, very effective insecticide, which now has, is sort of like out of fashion. And yet it's, it's still quite effective, but resistance has evolved in some cases. Um, but in the times where they have actually successfully eradicated Aedes aegypti in small places, they were using DDT in those programs. Um, this is a really interesting point that uh, I think is worth talking about. And it relates to sort of their evolved habitats associating with us is in this paper, what they just say is they essentially say the only times that this has worked, what they have done is the government. So if this is the government, the government has set up like an autonomous um, like body of like people. So you could, you could almost think of this as like an independent military, like that doesn't have to like answer to the government. Like they've literally set up like um, a separate entity whose sole job is to eradicate mosquitoes and they don't answer to anybody. So the only way that they've been able to do this is essentially establishing like a, like kind of like a dictatorial organization. And the reason that this is necessary is because again, imagine if you are in a community um, on an island and you want to eradicate mosquitoes. And just imagine this is in Alabama. Imagine in Alabama, we want to eradicate mosquitoes and you have a family or not a family, but you have a neighborhood of people. Okay. And each of these people own their own house. This is all private property. And Sam thinks it's okay to have a pool in his backyard. And Mary thinks it's okay to have a pool in her backyard. The only way to eradicate mosquitoes is to have like individual people who have unlimited authority to go onto private property and force Mary to like get rid of her, get rid of her pool. So this will never ever work in a place like the United States where people value private property and essentially like no government, like get off my private property. It will never work. But in the cases where it has worked, that's what they had the power to do. They had the power to go onto private property and literally like walk into people's houses and enforce mosquito control. Um, yes. So like, again, you guys should really read this paper that I signed because it's a fascinating paper that talks about like what fell into place when they actually were able to eradicate mosquitoes. And, and then there's also conditions where it failed. So this paper analyzes how did it work? What were the conditions that made it work? What were the conditions where it failed? Um, it fails in general on the mainland because as soon as you eradicate uh, Egypti, more Egypti just fly in from the neighboring countries which are not participating in the control program. So again, like unless you had sort of like territorial control over the entire like South America, you'd never be able to eradicate it because they would just fly in from a neighboring country. Um, and this is like, these kinds of efforts take long term, like many, many, many years. And how likely is it that you're going to have government funding for a 20 year program? It's very unlikely. So usually funding runs out and this sort of programs just kind of collapse. On top of that, when using insecticides, there's resistance that pops up on top of that. Again, these are long programs and many times they're sort of like, what you what you maybe call like governmental instability like in, in many of these countries which are third world countries they might not have a stable government and so you maybe try to do this program or maybe the guy maybe the people next door don't have a stable government and so it just it, it never usually works um and even if it does work 
there's a whole new species that's even better evolved, which will just come in and invade your country. So <laughs> it's like, even if you get rid of Egypti, usually Albopictus just invades. Um, skip that. Okay, I got six minutes left. We'll talk a little bit about Albopictus because Albopictus is an invasive mosquito that's spreading throughout North America. We originally got, in, in the United States, we originally got Aedes albopictus from a contaminated shipment of tires that was brought to Texas. I don't know where Houston is, but I think it's Houston. Maybe Houston's like somewhere around here. Um, this is where it started. Okay, so it started around here in Texas and you can see it's spread and it's established all over the South and it just continuously moves up and up and up and up. Okay. And the reason it moves up and up and up, what's the difference between the South and the North? Heat. So Aedes aegypti, you hear about Aedes aegypti in the Florida Keys. You hear about it in Gulf, Texas, Southern Texas. We hear about it a tiny bit in Southern Alabama, aegypti. But aegypti is really, its range is really limited because it's a tropical mosquito. Albopictus is different, okay? Albopictus does what's called diapause, okay? And it does a unique form of diapause. So diapause, it may be, did you learn this in insect physiology? Yes, okay. Diapause is kind of like insect hibernation. And Aedes albopictus, what they can do is they can, she can lay eggs, okay? And the mother has sensory organs which sort of monitor they're, they're these are associated with the circadian rhythms they monitor how much light is exposed to the mosquito in the day so the mosquito knows when it's starting to get close to winter because the days get shorter and the weather gets colder obviously so when the circadian clocks match up and the mosquito makes a decision it's getting close to winter the mom programs the eggs to do diapause, okay? So she lays the eggs in a diapause state, and what happens is those eggs fully develop, and they fully develop into the first instar larvae, but that larvae never hatches. It knows it shouldn't come out of the shell because it's not safe to come out of the shell in the winter. So it just sits in what's called the first ferrate, it's called ferrate instar, and it sits inside the egg, overwinters in the egg, and then as soon as the floods come in the spring, it pops out and you have mosquitoes. So now knowing that Albopictus has this unique super ability to do diapause, that explains why when you look at the range of Albopictus, here's a good study from a researcher who I knew at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. He monitored Albopictus, this is Connecticut. So this is, if you look at this United States map, this is Connecticut up here. So this map is already outdated. This red showing Albopictus. This is this state right here, zoomed in. And this is a longitudinal study over years since 2006 to 2016, a 10 year period. And you can see the black dots. These are the sampling points all across the state. And the black dots are dots where they found Albopictus. So in 10 years, Albopictus has expanded into Connecticut and it continues to just go north and north and north because of this ability to do diapause. So the nasty thing about this is that all the diseases that Aegypti can spread, like Zika, dengue, yellow fever, Albopictus can also spread all those diseases and its range is much more expanded. Talked about this, talked about this. Almost done here. Um, there's an interesting thing about mosquitoes. They're kind of like, have you, have you guys heard the story about the coral? Like there's special corals in the ocean that they somehow like know exactly when to like send out their sperm. And then they like, like all over the world, certain corals like go through sex in like a 15 minute period. Mosquitoes kind of have a similar thing and they have this periodicity where if you look at, if you go to like the rainforest and you wait till like five o'clock 
and the evening starts, you'll get a surge of mosquitoes at maybe like 5 to 5.15. And you'll get another surge of mosquitoes at maybe like 5.15 to 5.30. And you'll get another surge of mosquitoes at like 5.30 to 5.45. And each of these is a different species. So when they mate and when they feed, they have evolved to sort of like aliquot out the times of the day at which they feed, right? Because if you're a mosquito and you're competing with another species, you probably don't want to try to feed at the same time as they're feeding because it's sort of like competition. So they've sort of evolved to segment the day. And it's like this particular species has this time of day. This particular species has this time of day. That's called periodicity. So there's a story of this person in the in the rainforest, a researcher in the rainforest, and they literally describe that. Every 15 minute intervals, you can see different species pop out of mosquitoes. Um, and they also do that because if you're if your species one and you come out late, you're gonna be mating with the wrong species. And those offspring are obviously not gonna survive in most cases. Quick, almost done. Last slide, questing behavior. So they are attracted to CO2, um, body size, heat, things like that. People always ask, well, the mosquitoes always come and they bite me and they like my blood. And that's probably actually true. They can like smell stuff and they probably do have preferences. And certainly so some people are, are more attractive to certain mosquitoes. So that is everything you need to know about mosquitoes. The end. Questions?